Uh, and, and sorry, we're not drinking coffee. I actually. Oh, did you see? I do have coffee with me. Yeah, no, I, 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 I cannot drink. No, I, I tweeted uh, something yesterday, the day before yesterday, about how excited I was and that uh, I, will, uh, I may need vodka. <laughs> and uh, Kelly said her drink of choice is coffee. If I drink coffee at this time of day, uh, I'll be awake till Monday. So, uh, <laughs> what time I, of day I, is it where you are? Where are you? Well, well I'm, in, I, I'm in Florida, so um, oh. I'm, I'm so busy. <laughs> it's only three o'clock. I'll be drinking coffee till at least nine. Yeah, I'm, I'm in well, Paris. I, can't, can't you tell my my Orlandian accent or whatever it is? Yeah. It's, very broad, so uh, no, I, I uh, caffeine doesn't. I can have one cup in the morning, and that's it. Do you want? Have you started recording or one? Uh, yeah, of course. That's that's the best bit at the moment. You know, like tell me <laughs> everything about the coffee thing. You know, that's very good. <laughs> okay. Now I'm in Paris, so I have I have an excuse, and it's nine p.m. for me, so I can drink whatever I want. Cool. <laughs> that's a very, it's a good question, though. What do you drink, Kelly? You know. In your profession, yeah. are you allowed to drink I, alcohol, or do you do you indulge yourself with alcohol and stuff? You know, that's a good question. Yeah. I actually don't drink alcohol, and it's not for any particular moral reason. It's um, I don't like the effect that it has on me. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm an experimentalist. I don't do good work, and I'm not my best self. And I'm a lightweight, so all it takes is a glass of wine for me to turn into some weirdo I don't particularly <laughs> like. So uh, yeah, I kind of just stopped. We would have, but, but caffeine cool. makes me happy and productive, and so you know, I'm caffeine all day long. We would have wow. loved to, to have seen that actually. Yeah, that, we, we, we would love to see that. I have to evil side. We should do two interviews: the, the one on coffee, and then the one on a couple of glasses of wine. And look I'll at the difference. You what, if you if we get your podcast to a few more listeners, you could get the first drink in me in many years. Well, so I'll give you a challenge. Oh, yeah. look at that now. Se That's second that conversation we can do. We can yeah. do Sober Kelly and then Tipsy Kelly, and your listeners can vote on who has the greatest wisdom or who's okay. more entertaining. Uh that's a bed then that's Kelly you know that's that's a bed that we are taking right now you know? <laughs> so it means that we are serious next time that we're having you you have a glass of wine okay yeah, yeah exactly cool. okay very good Tim so I know yeah, how much you love Kelly. You know, you, you're the fun boy. So I'm just, I'm just scared right now what you'll say because Kelly, you know, he is, uh, I, I know my team for a long time now and I know that he's stressed and anxious to talk to you because... Good, well, that's, then he'll probably do an excellent job because as we all know, stress yeah. Yeah. can be your friend. See, I'm yeah. just giving you... Uh, anyway. I, I've got the, the oxytocin and the cortisol and the adrenaline are all pumping through my veins as we speak. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, beautiful. you are you you are uh, possibly the longest person for us to get on the podcast from the initial ask, uh, which I like did after three years ago. Probably <laughs> uh, no, we've not been doing the podcast three years. Um, we have you, one year and a half now. Yeah, yeah, that's that's not three years. I think we will find one year and a half. You, you, go and get math for dummies or something because one year and a half isn't three years. <laughs> uh, but, and we had some issues with James Altucher um, and that took a long time, but I think this, this took even, even longer. And it really stemmed out of um, me reading, and, and we're going to get onto the, um, the upsides of stress, uh, but I, I, I read the, the Willpower Instinct, so I got the unabridged audio version of Willpower Instinct, Willpower Instinct, and then I wrote a very, um, I was going to say over the top, I'm not sure if it is over the top is the right word, um, blog post saying, is this the greatest self-development book ever written? Because <laughs> um, it, it changed my view on a lot of things. Um, and and, and I, I have a tendency with, with, uh, with book reviews, if, if I read a book and I don't like it, I just don't review it. I just don't like putting out negative reviews. Um, yeah. It just doesn't. I see no value in it. I may tell other people I didn't like the book, but I don't want to spend time, you know, dragging through. And I have, and I did a, a um, an Amazon link through to see how many copies of the book I sold because I sent it to my users list, and and we eventually got over a hundred copies of the book sold, which is easily the most I've ever sold by uh, recommending a book. And I thought it was fantastic, and and then. I'd already seen your talk on, on TED, uh, which we're going to come back to, so I then went and bought The Upside of Stress, and I thought, 
then I was like, oh, fuck, this might even be better. I can't say this is better. I can't say this is the best book on self-development. Now I've just said that's the, it'll look like I'm stalking her or something. So I actually... <laughs> yeah, right now you look like I, one, my friend, but that's okay, you know, please. <laughs> It's the Englishman in me. We, we, all, we all look like that. So uh, the upside of stress was just phenomenal. But it's what I want to ask you. So, you know, you're in the top 20 viewed TED Talks of all time. And uh, I was looking at it this morning and I, I was shocked. And, and there's some, you know, you're, you're among some fantastic talks, in my opinion. Um, and there's probably been, now you include TEDx, you know, there's, there's been hundreds of TED Talks and you're in the top 20. And I think it, that's for, because it, you know, it breaks the norm, it shatters the paradigm. Two days ago, I got an email from a woman. She, she got more letters after a name than I've got in my name. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a doctor and she was saying how stress is destroying society and she mm. wanted to review a book. And... And, and, and I kind of get lost then, I, I, you know, because everything you say makes sense and, and kind of what she says makes sense. And what, what you say goes against my training with stress management, which is how I got into life coaching. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards believing that because of the, the power of the human belief system. So the question is, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you get frustrated by the fact that, you know, um, people aren't taking on board the message and it's still this big demon of stress or, or are you pretty cool about it and just want to deliver the message to people who want to hear it, basically? Yeah, I think the latter is more the case. I, you know, sometimes I get a little bit personally frustrated when I see people clinging to beliefs that are really creating suffering, unnecessary suffering. But I don't at all mind the fact that it's really hard to wrap your head around the possibility that stress can be awful and amazing and it can be harmful and helpful. You know, the thing about stress is it's really complex and I can't expect everyone to have spent the last 15 years of their lives reading, you know, every study that's ever come out published about stress, which is basically what I've done. Um, and, you know, my head can explode when I try to think about and hold the complexities um, and how our mindset can interact with things that we believe to be true and expect to be true. And suddenly, somehow, they're not true, depending on, you know, mm -hmm. our current mental state and mindset. So, you know, I, I don't get, uh, I, I kind of take it in stride. My goal with every book I write, they're not intellectual arguments, Um I'm really interested in helping people suffer less and thrive more and be able to contribute more to people they care about and communities they care about and reach goals that matter to them. So in a way, I'm very pragmatic. Uh, and that means I don't actually end up getting in a lot of conversations with people who want to argue about whether or not stress is all good or all bad. Mm -hmm. um, I will say the thing that frustrates me most is that I have found a lot of people's intuitions are backward you know, compared to the science. And I do get frustrated when people make assumptions that are not based on the science, but based on just general beliefs about the way things should work. And mm -hmm. I don't always get an opportunity to come in and correct them. I'll give you an example. I was recently giving a talk at Stanford and it was on leadership. And I was talking about all the things I talk about in the upside of stress, you know, how it's important to embrace the energy of stress, why it's important to feel like you have something to offer to, to be able to help others, even when you yourself are dealing with a lot of struggles, uh, taking a growth mindset, sort of basic stuff. And afterwards, I got feedback from the host that, you know, most people really loved the presentation, but there was one woman who left saying that she was disappointed because while the ideas made sense to her, they would never, ever apply to the population she works with. And I, I asked the host, well, what population does she work with? And it turns out she was a professor of education who studies uh, at-risk youth. And that, that is the kind of thing that drives me crazy because if you've read the book, you know that actually all of the mindset interventions I talk about, they were initially studied yeah. among at-risk youth in educational settings. And yeah. that's exactly for whom it's most effective. But I didn't get a chance to mention that because that's not the sort of intended audience of that particular talk. And I find that that sort of thing happens a lot, where people make these assumptions like, oh, well, you're only talking about traffic jams. You're not talking about trauma. 
or mm. this couldn't possibly be true if you have an anxiety disorder. You mean only if people aren't really anxious, if they're like fake anxious, not suffering from debilitating anxiety. And almost every time someone has that sort of intuition, like what I'm saying is nice, but it's not true for people who are really, you know, swimming in what I would call the reality of stress. Um, it's exactly the opposite. So I would say that's the only part of this that frustrates, that really frustrates me. Um, particularly because my goal is to help those people who are not just, you know, I, I frankly, I don't care about everyday hassles. I want to help people who are really struggling. And, and that is, you know, exactly the group for whom embracing stress seems to be most important. Did, did you get um, or have you had much pushback from the academic community? Because obviously, no. Mm, not at all. No, because that's the, those are the folks who are producing the science. And, you know, I, I admit I'm a little bit privileged to be at Stanford University where a lot of the initial mindset research came out of and a lot of the best interventions are coming now. In fact, even since I wrote the book, uh, one of the researchers I wrote about is now a professor at Stanford, um, Ali Crum. And go. so I feel like I'm sort of swimming in this place of people who are at the forefront of research on stress and mindset interventions. Um, the, the main pushback I've experienced are from people who have defined their careers in terms of helping people reduce or eliminate stress. Um, you know, like people who, whose business names have things like get rid of your stress now in the name of the business, you know, and then, and I totally appreciate that. I, I mean, I, I didn't write about this in the book, but I remember very clearly the first conversation I had with my Zen teacher where she was challenging me to reconsider a belief I had. And I kept saying to her, but I have evidence, but there is data. I can prove to you that this is harmful. And it wasn't about stress. It was, it was about sleep of all things. And, uh, and I remember her just saying, yes, Kelly, and like, what would it mean to look at how that belief affects your direct experience? And like, I, I couldn't quite get that, that like, there are two different ways to investigate something. You can look at your data and you know, try to prove a particular hypothesis, and you'll almost always be able to find the data to support that. Or you can look at direct experience and try on different ways of viewing your own experience and see if that actually creates shifts that are meaningful and useful. And that's, you know, that's more what I'm interested in than trying to create some sort of abstract intellectual argument uh, where I decide to believe some data over other data and then put that forward. I'd rather people pay attention to their direct experience. Mm -hmm. Do, do, do you ever feel like, you know, there's a lot, been lots of talk over the last few years, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, Olivier, so don't worry, with, with, um, <laughs> with, the, with the paleo movement, the paleo movement, mm. and, and the fact that the, you know, the, the belief that the food table is upside down and that really you know, grains aren't particularly good for us and, and so on and so forth, and they're, they're, they're trying to break a massive... Um, you know, they're trying to change the paradigm of how people think about things. And I think in some respects, you're trying to do the same because for, you know, every person that watches your talk on TED or reads your book, there are probably 10 others that have read a blog post by an idiot like me saying how to reduce stress. Uh, and I've written those posts, you know, I mean, my, my, as I said before, my introduction into life coaching was doing stress management. I mean, even at the time, I thought it was outdated and ridiculous, but um, you know, there is, the, it, it's it, it's a huge movement to change that. It's, we're not talking of like subtle incremental change, and I wonder, you know, do you think that's going? To, do you think it will happen? And, and if so, is it something that's going to take decades rather than years? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's the way you frame it. It sounds like it's, you know, it needs to be some big movement. And frankly, I'm just a teacher. I think of myself as a teacher and I am most interested in individual human beings that I come into contact with in my classes or in my workshops. And then, of course, I imagine my readers as individuals whose lives might benefit from particular teachings. And that's the only level at which I can operate. If I think that I have to, like, change the culture or, I mean, that, I'm not that kind of warrior. 
I really function best when I'm looking at a human being and can have a conversation with them. And that's how I think about my books too, sort of having a conversation with one reader at a time. So, you know, I don't know if it's ever going to change. And then, of course, I also think that sometimes it's just there's so many people who um, have a vested interest in maintaining a particular conversation. And you mentioned the food industry, and that's certainly another industry that has a lot of resources and a lot of you know, habits that are based on needing to make money in a certain way. And that's going to be true for the stress reduction industry also. Um, I think of myself in the suffering reduction industry, which is a different thing. And I think that people come to these ideas sort of one at a time when their own lives demand it. And in many ways, I think that trying to talk to people about these ideas sort of before they're ready, it's not going to particularly land. One of the things that we know about mindset interventions is they actually, they work at key transitions or at crisis points. So if I go out there and I'm just trying to convince, you know, a billion people at a time, hey, you know what, you should take a growth mindset on, on difficult things in your life. Well, until someone's actually trying to recover from a very difficult experience, you know, they may agree or may not, but it's not a necessarily a particularly helpful message to receive. Um, I've been really excited to hear from people who are sharing my book with specific communities that have a, a kind of a common thread of stress or suffering, people who are grieving or people who are in recovery, people who are dealing with chronic pain, people, you know, college freshmen arriving at campus. And I feel like that's kind of the right way to do this, that this message should come across at key points in your life and, and hopefully within a caring community of other people who are going through what you're going through. And uh, I'll leave changing the world to other people, have more stamina for that kind of uh, challenge. Well, that's what we're doing, isn't it, Olivia? We're, we're ch- Are you, you're changing the world more broadly. Yeah, I think. Are we changing the world? I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe changing a, minds, changing lives. We are, yeah. We're changing ourselves. I know that I was a uh, lot thinner before this podcast, and you too, Tim. You were, <laughs> yeah, I think you gained some weight, and I gained some weight. Yeah, no, well. I, have, I have. And I have some gray hair as well, so I've changed myself. But yeah, ca- okay. can I backtrack a little, actually? Because, you know, this podcast doesn't have any structure at all. You know, that's, that's the beauty of this podcast. There's, there's no structure. But uh, for people who haven't seen your TED Talk, you know... Um, what is your stance? Because you, we immediately jumped into the, the details uh, of the book. But uh, what is the, the stance? What is the core message of this, of this, of this, uh, of your book, The Upside of Stress? You what? know, I'm glad you asked me that question because yeah. it's going to give me a chance to tell a story that I've actually never told publicly before. Oh, great! Oh, Thank wow. you. This is, yeah, we've this got is an exclusive copyrights. <laughs> 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 this is a behind-the-scenes sort of how one gets to give a TED talk and how I decided what to give my TED talk on. So um, you guys probably know my sister has given a couple of TED talks that have been very popular. Like she gave one of the early TED talks and was, she was like on the TED commercial for Apple phones or something. Anyway, so she was, she was really big in the TED community and she had been talking to the organizers like, Hey, you should have my sister give a TED talk. And they kept coming back to her saying, okay, well, maybe, what does she do? What's her research on? Uh, what would she talk about? And I don't know if, if you both actually know this, but my core research is on compassion. Like the science I actually do, not just writing about other people's research and synthesizing it, but my actual research is on the benefits of training compassion and empathy mm. and how, how one might do that. And uh, right now I'm looking at the effects of training physicians in compassion and empathy. So I wanted to talk about compassion and they kept coming back being like, mm, no thanks. Uh, and this happened like three years in a row. They were like, we're interested in your sister, right? Because who wouldn't be interested in the identical twin sister of one of the best TED talkers of all time, but they did not want to talk on compassion. <laughs> And that is my core message. So I was like, so my sister sent me an email. She's like, look, I know what the theme of this TED Global is going to be. Do you think you could come up with something that fits the theme? Mm. And the theme was think again. Mm. And I thought, what could I talk about that would allow me to give a sneaky talk about compassion that doesn't sound like it's about compassion? And uh, as part of my introduction to psychology course that I've been teaching for years, I give this lecture in health psychology, and I started to give a different type of lecture on stress because I had started to notice that the typical lecture on stress given to 
psychology students, like right before final exams, was depressing them. I was telling them about how stress would make them sick and kill brain cells and ruin their lives, which is the talk that I had been given in Psych 1. And um, I had started to give this different lecture about some new research showing that how you think about stress really matters, that stress can be helpful, and that in particular, if you choose to embrace stress, embrace the energy of it, uh, view it as something that can help you, view it as your body and brain trying to rise to the challenge, that that particular mindset seems to make your stress response healthier. It helps you perform better under pressure. It protects against things like emotional burnout that we might associate with chronic stress. So I started to give that lecture, and my students were really responding well to it. And I'd actually started giving that, that sort of lecture in other courses that I taught about stress. And I was like, well, that fits the theme of this TED conference. It was called, you know, Think Again. It's like, well, I'll have them rethink stress because one of the things that almost nobody knows about stress is that it can make us more compassionate. You know, there's mm -hmm. compassion born of suffering or altruism born of suffering. We know that stress often prompts a tend and befriend response that makes us want to connect to others. It, it increases our caregiving motivation. Relationships can be strengthened by stress. So I thought, okay, I'll give this whole rethink stress talk and then I'll be able to sneak compassion in at the end of it. And so that it was my TED Talk, and I view the core message of my TED Talk actually being the part that uh, it's a, like the very last thing that I say, which is that when you're experiencing stress, you know, you could choose courage. You could choose to believe that whatever you're facing, that you can handle it, that you are adequate to the challenge of your own life, and importantly, to know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That's the core message of the talk. And it, you know, it is delivered through some of this really exciting new science that says that stress has a lot of attributes we don't often recognize, like that it can make us more caring and mm -hmm. empathic sometimes, and that it gives us energy, and that if we choose to view stress in that way, that we actually get better at stress and mm -hmm. can be more effective in our own lives and happier and healthier. And of course, what everyone remembers from the stress talk is like the thing that I just use as a hook which was a totally true story, but there's this one bizarre study that found that stress only seemed to increase the risk of mortality among people who at the beginning of the study thought that their stress was harmful for their health. And I use it as a launching point because that was a totally true story. When I read that study, I had like this major crisis moment of, oh my gosh, I've been telling everyone that stress is bad for them. I'm probably killing people. But it's like one study, and it was a correlational study, you know, it was epidemiology. It's not like I thought that that study proved anything in particular. Um, and, and I would say of all the people who have gotten upset about the TED Talk or the book, uh, like that was very triggering for a lot of people, this, mm -hmm. that particular finding, which to me was a curiosity. It certainly isn't like the core premise of the book. Mm. Anyways, but so now you know how I ended up giving that TED Talk. They didn't want compassion, but I snuck it in there anyway. How strange, you know, how weird. Yeah. You know? That is, that is uh, it's strange because, um, yeah, I, I was actually listening to uh, the Neuroscience of Change yesterday mm. and I, I was in the car when you said, okay, we're going to do a guided uh, meditation now, uh, but obviously don't do this if you drive. And I was like, fuck, I always have three books in the car. Yeah, and I thought, um, I, I don't know what you... You, you know where you went on to uh, to, to go with it, and I will, I will get back to it and listen to it in my own home. But to me, um, meditations like Metabhavana and anything that increases compassion. You know, I, I live in Orlando, and we've probably mm -hmm. just gone through the worst yeah. week. You know, and uh, you know, people remember the pulse, and a lot of people don't remember the fact that the girl uh, Christina Grimmie, who was shot in the head the night before. At a, at a club I've been to many times at a, at a concert venue and I recognised where the pieces were taken and the, the kid was taken by the alligator and, and drowned and uh, you know th this is I, I don't think there's ever been a time well probably there has I don't know I'm not a historian but there's seldom been a time certainly not in my lifetime where compassion's more important and, and with it um you kind of almost by default wipe out a lot of the human misery. Um, so there wasn't really a question there. No, I which, think it was just a statement. I think. Yeah, that was just me rambling. Uh, rambling but rambling but yeah. and, and, and the thing that I'm really, I mean, one of the things I'm most passionate about is being actually um, really brutally introspective and 
curious about how it is that our compassion collapses. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that, um, yeah. Are you still there? Yeah, we're still yeah, there. We're, oh, okay. Still my my office. Skype okay. is doing it. Uh, okay, let, let me just uh, close the, my video. That's okay. We can continue. Um, you know, I, I try to be ruthlessly introspective and curious about how our compassion collapses. And I think that's as important as asking questions like, how do we get good at stress? Or how do we have more willpower and self-control? And I think that they're actually very related and that's one of the things that I find people sometimes struggle with, this idea of, well, you know, how can you say that stress is good for you when we're in the middle of, of suffering from such atrocities? And is that supposed to be good for us? Or why didn't stress, you know, make this terrorist a better person? Why did it instead turn him into someone who lacks empathy and takes pleasure from destroying lives? And I feel like this is that there's something sort of that holds all of that together that has to do with the incredible need we have as human beings to be able to make meaning out of our lives and feel connected. Mm. And I have found sort of my place in, in research and academics and in teaching by deciding I'm just going to go after that piece of trying to help people make meaning out of their lives uh, and trust that it sort of does, it serves all of these aims, whether we're trying to make people healthier or happier uh, or more, you know, what, whatever their own personal goal is. Mm. But to me, it's it's kind of well. When I say strange, when you said you know the, the, for the TED talk, they didn't want you to to do this compassion piece or mm -hmm. empathy piece. But if you look at these two words, um, compassion, empathy, which are very very important, as Tim pointed out at the moment, you know, and it feels like everyone needs that, but nobody, nobody at the moment will will say these words today, you know. And I'm looking the news from from paris and i don't see that you know i don't see this this kind of movement so what is happening here you know uh, kelly is, is there like something uh, and i know that you've been with jack cortfield by the way you mm -hmm. know one of our heroes you know and i'm so yes. jealous yes. so Can jealous it's our podcast we really want him please on our you know yeah. we're trying for so long <laughs> anyway so that's we'll pay you after if you want yeah but yeah. but for me the question is is it like what is lacking what is missing right now how can we win this you know how can we make like compassion and empathy something that people will want to hear you know i you know so i spend a lot of time teaching compassion and that means i hear a lot of people's arguments against compassion mm -hmm. and you know i will say one of the things that comes up over and over is that people feel like their own suffering has not been acknowledged and that gives rise to a kind of anger and lack of empathy for others. And it's funny, right, because actually compassion, so, so what it seems like is though people need to be the recipient of compassion before they are most people, right? So, some people, are, you know, are born with an incredible gift for compassion and empathy. Um, and I don't want to take that away from people who have suffered greatly and that has triggered for them this amazing compassion and empathy. But for most people, until they've been the recipient of it, it's very hard to awaken that instinct in people because people are so desperate to have their own suffering validated and remedied that it feels like a risk or it feels unfair, unjust to have to have compassion or empathy for someone else. And I feel like that's a real sticking point. Um, and it becomes a sort of catch-22 where people need to be the recipient of compassion often before they become their most compassionate selves. And then so many people, even those who are interested in compassion, don't feel like those people are deserving of compassion. So they want to withhold their compassion until those people are compassionate enough to deserve compassion. <laughs> and we start having all these rules about sort of who we can and or will or will not feel compassion for. And, you know, one of the things that we teach in um, this program that I, I study at Stanford, the compassion cultivation training at Stanford, you know, we have to work around a lot of that resistance. Like you have to sort of give up some of your inner rules about who is and is not deserving of your compassion as a way of, of breaking that kind of vicious cycle. But I think that that's one of the reasons why you don't see... And, and, the flip side is you also have to look for compassion. One of the things that I teach in the trainings is to become a compassion detective because it's very easy to see. I mean, hate is very obvious. Mm. Uh, anger and vengeance are very clear yeah. when they're present. And it's very easy to become hypervigilant to that. I certainly would have a tendency toward that. It's really important to look for the compassion and empathy, which is almost always also there. Um, 
but because it's less threatening, sometimes our, you know, our brains don't pay as much attention to it and we don't remember it as much. Um, and we need to really savor and see and appreciate and acknowledge and tell stories of compassion so that other people also get a sense that, that compassion is available. Mm. Can, can yeah, you, I, I think... Um, Sorry, just one sec, Tim, uh, when you can do... Kelly, I think your, um, your mic is scratching your... Um, I don't oh. know if you, yeah, so... so uh, okay, I'm going to hold it in front of my mouth. Sounds like you've got a bracelet that's made of I a thousand you know. shells. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, I think it was my braid, maybe. My braid was touching it. Is this better? Um, yeah, it's better, better. Yeah, you, that's right, yeah. And I think, you know, um, uh, everything that you just said made, makes perfect sense. You know, and, and I'm on social media, and somebody said to me about um, I'm a life coach, I was training, talked to me about social media, and I said, you know, don't follow my example on social media. I'm a complete dick on social media. I spend <laughs> most of my time winding up Donald Trump or trying to wind up Donald Trump because I find it, uh, you know, I find it very difficult. Uh, and this is the thing, it, it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to feel compassion for the victims of the pulse uh, unless you're a raging homophobe or, you know, or, or, or what have you. But for, for, you know, for the vast majority just people, it's very easy to 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 feel that, uh, and then you know, on 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 the flip side, is somebody like Trump who 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 scares the bejesus out of me, to be quite honest with you, uh, and and I find it very difficult. I mean, can, can you do that? I mean, can you feel compassionate towards somebody um, that maybe? And, and I'm jumping to conclusions now, Kelly. So you know, you could say, well, actually, I support Donald Trump, in which case, I'm going to look very foolish, but. <laughs> Maybe the antithesis of, of, of what you stand for and try to get your head around and understand their opinion. Yes. And this often requires people redefining what compassion is. A lot of people believe that compassion means liking someone, approving of them, condoning behaviors that they view as uh, creating harm and suffering in the world. Um, whereas compassion, compassion is basically it's, an ability to see suffering and a desire to relieve suffering and a willingness to respond in a way that might relieve that suffering. So if you were to take the example of a political figure or anyone in the world who you think is creating harm in the world, what compassion might mean is not, you don't necessarily need to understand that person's childhood and, and how they've suffered. You could simply look at that situation and ask yourself, you know, what is it like to wake up in the morning and this be the reality of who you are. And, you know, what, is, what, what do you think the reality is of being perhaps a narcissist or of having so much hate for other groups or living in so much fear or spending your life? So, I mean, you know, and I, like there's, there's a reality to what we often are judging and that is a form of suffering and it's people always say well they're not suffering in the right way like sure you can say that being a narcissist is a form of suffering because you don't have deep meaningful relationships or a sense of connection to something bigger than yourself but I want that person to suffer pain or suffer humiliation or suffer something else um, and you kind of have to give up your desire for people to suffer in the way that you think they should suffer or suffer enough and actually see that as a kind of suffering that gives rise to behavior that creates more suffering for others. And so the compassion is often sort of, may we all be free of this. It's not, you know, may you have, uh, may you reach all of your individual desires. It, that, that's not necessarily compassion. You know, I don't have to wish that every person who's out spreading hate in the world fulfills their desire to spread hate. I could simply think, you know, this behavior has its roots in seeds of suffering and I am going to wish that you suffer less so that you might create less suffering in the world and we all be free of it. And that's, that's a, the kind of compassion that I think is, frees us to be then become engaged in ways that are, are more productive in our own lives, whether it's going to be to vote, to actually vote rather than feel overwhelmed and you know, despair whether it's to get involved in your own community or in politics, whether it's to decide that you want to put your energy and attention towards being a good parent instead of trolling people on Twitter. I mean, you know, I don't know what, but there's huh. different ways of expressing that compassion. I don't mean that you're trolling people. <laughs> no, he's no, trolling a lot. He's I trolling. I have got kids. So I'm using the time when I haven't got kids to troll people on Twitter. Yeah. Or one, one person. One person in particular. Yeah. yeah. 
right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, so whatever, uh, whatever wholesome desire that people want to put their atten- energy and attention towards, I, I'd probably be a more a fan of. But so, so yeah. how, how? Well, I, I often do, do use him when I do the, the Meta Bhavana or love, loving kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's actually very, very few people that I, I dislike. I, I tend to just drift away and forget about people that I don't, I don't care for. And uh, he's often the person, you know, for anybody who doesn't know this, you, um, it, it can vary slightly, but it's you, you give compassion to yourself and then to, to somebody that you're aware of but don't really know. And then uh, a bigger point to a close friend and then somebody you're aware of that you don't know and then somebody you have difficulties with or, or dislike. And I often choose... Donald Trump with that, and it and, and it and it, it, it you know it's 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 difficult. It's difficult because um, well, I don't know. I'm just making excuses. I'm, I was going to say because of this, because of that, and that 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 then sounds. I'm trying to justify. Can, can, my you, tr- can you try harder? That's it. Can you try a little bit harder, man, and be compassionate, even for <laughs> Trump? <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to get to the end of it and feel comfortable. Otherwise, it's pointless. And I, and I do do that. I can get that. And then ten minutes later, is offended another group of people. Okay. And I'm like, oh no. Okay. I can't. Okay. Okay, okay. So, Kelly, yes. okay, here, here's the deal. If my friend Tim managed to be compassionate with Trump, okay, can we have you and Jack Confield on the next podcast? <laughs> can we do that? You know? You know, uh, <laughs> that first of all, I think that'd be a wonderful conversation because um, I would love to see uh, you guys. Uh, I, you know, one of my great uh, aims as an interviewer is to try to get people pushed off balance a little bit and mm-hmm. I did try to do that with Jack when I interviewed him for uh, City Arts and Lecture and I bet you guys could actually do a really good job of that. Um, I sense that you guys are, yeah, are good at trying you. to push people off balance a little bit. So I'd be down for that conversation whether or not um, Tim you're able to feel an authentic compassionate <laughs> wish for whoever is difficult for you. I would be down with that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, um, Jack, Jack Confield, first of all, I love his voice. I've, I've listened to a number of his, his audio books, and his voice just makes me want to be more peaceful. He's got that so, he's so calm and collected, you know what I mean? And it's just, uh, yeah, that, that, would, that, would be, that, that would be very cool. See, I, actually I like him. my meditation teachers a little bit abrasive. Then when I think about like my favorite teachers, they are, they're, have a sense of humor and they right. often are, you know, that's because I study, have studied so much in the Zen tradition. I like right. people, who, it's almost like, I, I hate the phrase keeping it real, but I do feel like some meditation teachers are really good at that. Um, and I tend to, meditation teachers who I experience as being soft and flowery, I'm, <laughs> I, I find myself like recoiling and looking f- for someone a little bit edgier. And I think that's how I ended up in Zen and some of the, then uh, compared to some of the other so you, you mean, so you your, your teacher swears during his meditation something like that? He's <laughs> really, can we do that? I, I have one of my favorite teachers, Natalie Goldberg. Um, she ha, she has a much more colorful vocabulary than I do. Yes, uh, she and yes, but but the thing is, oh. is it's it what it feels like is to me it feels feels grounded um and i really appreciate that in teachers people who feel very grounded mm. and sometimes that requires i, I guess an f-bomb i tell you t- two very very quick stories first of all uh my uh, um, meditation teacher not now actually although I, i'm still i've become friends with him uh body paxer um i can remember doing a, a, an online course with him and he sat down and Ah, oh, he says, I have been so stressed this week. And I was like, yes. You know, because for me as a life coach, you know, I make no pretense that my life is perfect. So, and, and I think that the, the coaches that do that do harm to the industry because none of our lives are perfect. And then we had a conversation, this is two or three years ago now, and, and I'm going to use a word uh, that, that is... In, Eng- in England, or well, he's, he's Scottish actually, but in, in Great Britain, it, it's nothing like as strong of a, a, a word as it is over here. It seems to take on a different, and it's also not gender specific, and we pronounce it slightly different. And it's the word twat, basically. And we were talking about authenticity. 
And we, we had this, there's three of us, we had this back and, co- um, back and forth conversation and Body Pack sort of eventually came in and said, yeah, he said, it's being yourself, but not yourself at your twattiest. Yes. And, uh, and I love that. And I thought I was brilliant. It's like, yeah, you can be yourself without being a dick about it and trying to offend people. Like it was, I, so are, did you read that article in the New York Times by Adam Grant? about the why being authentic is so overblown and it's sort of his core no. argument was it oh no. he, he very recently wrote this article got so much um attention you know in my small world in in the u.s um you know since he's a, a great academic psychologist and he he basically argued that people shouldn't be authentic because when you're authentic you will be the worst version of yourself and you will hit on married colleagues and you will you know, fly into rages and I read. I was like, "That's not my authentic self, yeah. actually." Yeah. Um, and it's such a weird assumption that to be authentic means expressing every possible impulse that you have. <laughs> I feel like my authentic self is a is a you know has a variety of opposites contained within it, and that I think my my positive values are more who I really am than my most base impulses. But I thought it was so interesting that that was the argument against authenticity. Mm. The sort of who you are at your core is your worst self. And that's exactly what I tried to argue against in the willpower instinct. Like, like that, even believing that <laughs> I, is so counterproductive. And I, I agree entirely. To, to me, being your author, I, I, I want to go for a drink with, with a client of mine or somebody I don't know but who's read my material and we have a drink or whether that's a coffee or a beer or whatever and they walk away thinking yes that is exactly how i thought he was that that mm-hmm. to me is being authentic it's not like you see it's not like saying you know we've all got a dark side you know psychology has proved this you know mm-hmm. I, I you look at this the stanford prison experiment and seeing what how how dark people's you know sort of um psyche can go and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's their authentic self otherwise basically there's a, a bunch of lunatics running seven billion lunatics running around this 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 planet all trying to trying to keep in their authentic self and it's basically how, how we are when we're on our own you know there's a there's a quote like um about um Oh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, and I can't think of the word now. But uh, basically, um, authenticity is doing the right thing, whether there's somebody there or not. Doing what you would do anyway, whether there's some, somebody there to, to view it or not. And uh, so, so I, so I basically that was a ridiculously long-winded um, <laughs> way, way of saying, yeah, I agree. I could have just said, yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. But, but is, is it something, that's interesting what you just said, you know, about, about uh, authenticity and being, you know, but is it something, uh, and uh, it reminds me of the prince from Machiavelli, who one of his, in this book, one of the premise that he says is everyone is bad, you know. Every mm-hmm. human being is just bad, selfish, and that's it. You know, that's one of the premise. So it, are we just have been inheriting this, this kind of thought of belief that everyone is bad? Which No, me, I, I yeah. think that actually human beings are bad and good. And that, mm. that, in that way, I differ from um, some of my colleagues who are Buddhist philosophers. You know, the, mm. the meditation that I teach comes from that tradition. And often I, you know, will respectfully disagree at the idea that of sort of basic goodness supersedes all other human instincts and capacities. Um, in my, my understanding as a scientist and as a psychologist, is that we all have the capacity to be sort of whatever is the worst version of, of humanity you can imagine. Mm. And that we may have different tendencies in that direction. You may have to push some of us harder than others to express certain instincts and tendencies. Um, but I think it's, it is critically important to recognize that. And so much of the harm that's done in the world and the harm that we do to ourselves as well is when we don't want to acknowledge that. And some people can't see the good in themselves and mm-hmm. some people can't see the bad in themselves mm-hmm. and vice versa. Some people cannot see the destructive forces that are in the world and need to be dealt with. And some people cannot see the good in groups that also give rise to conflict or, or harm. Mm-hmm. 
And it's that inability to understand that both are true and that everything from mindset to environment to relationships to the weather can influence that. That's really hard for people to accept. People, people want to feel like they have more of a fixed self hmm. and that yeah. others are predictable in a way that allows them to put them in categories. Hmm. That's true. Okay, can, can I ask an off the wall question, which mm -hmm. is a, it's, it's rhetorical because I was going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> do, do you not think, you know, the, there's so many issues going on in the world at the moment and there's so many people looking uh, in, in um, positions of power that are looking for solutions to these problems. But how often, you know, uh, and and it, it, this may be a rhetorical question because yeah, I'm not sure if you'll know the answer, but do, do you ever get asked or do you know anybody in your position that gets asked to buy some governmental force to come in and say, you know, what, what do we need to do about this? I, I watched an interview um, on, uh, with an ex-CIA operative and she, she worked undercover for 10 years and she said, if we can't stop and listen to these people, and one of the things she said was, um, the, the, she was she was interviewing a, uh, an Al Qaeda prisoner. He says, "You know, when you see all the American movies like um, Star Wars and Independence Day and, and what have you, it's all this scrappy band of individuals that are fighting against the evil in empire." He said, "That's us," and it kind of struck home with her that that it was that that's how they see themselves, and um, you know, very. Few people, if any, see themselves as as evil. So, first of all, do you get ever asked about things like that? And is that something that you you would like to see an, an expansion on? You know, the, the country being more compassionate toward other races, religions, and creeds, etc. You know, I don't get asked in that capacity very often. Um, which probably makes sense. I'm more likely to be asked how to help specific groups of people who are doing work that, that I actually think is consistent with that. I get asked often to, you know, talk to police officers or tr people who work in trauma rescue, people who work in healthcare, I think people, lawyers, um, people who are sort of in there doing tough work. Um, I do know that lots of psychologists have been consulted and, and there is a movement for sort of data-driven, evidence-based decision-making and policies, but that, I don't think that's gotten very far. I actually mm. think that that most people in politics do not trust that way of understanding reality, mm. that one might need to do experiments, that one can do statistical analyses to uncover things that you can't see just by looking at a community or looking at your own experience. I don't, I, I think it's tough. One of my colleagues, Greg Walton, served as a, a science advisor to Hillary Clinton when she was in the Senate. And, uh, you know, sort of, it was interesting to hear a little bit about that experience that, you know, individuals might be open to the idea that science has something to offer. Um, but that is really, I don't think that, that it is, um, mm -hmm. it's not, we're not there yet. Oh, that's, that's so, yeah. you know, to me, that's so sad. I don't know if you've ever read the book. Uh, I think it's called Blind Spots, mm -hmm. and uh, in in it, uh, there was an experiment where they they got a group of, of um, I don't know if it was Hezbollah, but it's some form of Arab group in 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 the West Bank to write up a peace proposal, and then they got uh, some Israelis to write up a peace proposal, and then they delivered it to a different group of people as being the Israeli one was written up by the Arabs and the, the mm -hmm. Arabic one was written up by the Israelis and they were immediately rejected, even though it was in reality their own people that had written yeah. up the, the peace proposal. And, and I read that, I thought, that's fascinating. And then, kind of like my heart sunk, I thought, it's also so depressing. You know, I'm dragging, it I'm dragging this conversation down. Let me yeah. tell a joke. <laughs> I know. Well, no, but what you're talking about, it's huge. And I've seen the research here in the U.S., the same thing. As soon as a politician who is prominent in either party endorses an idea, suddenly it polarizes opinion, whereas a poll before would have shown that there was almost no polarization on that until somebody right. took a stand. This is going to be very hard to fight that instinct. That is like the core human instinct, which is to say, I can't know everything, so I'm going to trust my tribe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people don't 
want to have to be responsible for actually weighing evidence. I mean, that's it's hard work. I mean, think about how many things I how many things I, I take on faith because it's the consensus of science or it's the consensus of of some other group that I respect. Um, I, that is a very tough thing to overcome, and I agree with you. It's it's maddening, but also I completely understand why it happens. Mm. I mean, we take 99.99% of things we believe, you know, on the value of somebody else having looked at the evidence or thought about it deeply. None of us have the time to do that ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So can I change subject because it's it's very depressing at the moment. So can we, I, I've noted one thing at the very beginning, you, you mentioned twice uh, a growth mindset, mm -hmm. growth mindset. So yeah. can you can you just explain that? What is this growth mindset? Yeah, uh, a growth mindset, the way I think about it, is it is the belief that every experience you have can be a catalyst for learning and growth, that you can choose in part how you grow in any given experience by by knowing how it is you want to develop or what, what it is you want to offer the world. And a growth mindset is basically remembering that uh, rather than getting derailed by other instincts, which might be, say, to prove yourself rather than to improve yourself mm -hmm. or to justify yourself rather than to be open to new ideas. Um, and a growth mindset you know, involves things like being willing to be uncomfortable, <laughs> being challenged by new ideas and new evidence, mm -hmm. putting yourself in situations where you're reasonably sure that you're going to fail because you trust that process as being the way that we learn and grow. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you could contrast that. Sometimes it's contrast with a fixed mindset, which is basically the idea that sort of who you are is fixed or your job in life is to try to, you know, try to find things that you're already good at and make sure nobody notices what's wrong with you because there's nothing mm. you can do about it. So, you know, hide it as mm. best you can. Mm. So that's fascinating, actually. Fascinating. Okay. Actually, that, I mean, that's based on the work of Carol Dweck. Yeah, she was the first person to really bring this forward. Although I, th you know, her yeah. work has primarily looked at it in um, in terms of intelligence and what you believe about intelligence. Right, right, right. And I've, I've, uh, I'm really interested in it at a much broader level, including looking at how communities can grow um, as a result of going through adversity. That it's, you know, because. One of the other things that I do in my spare time is I'm a fitness professional, and the way that I understand how oh bodies change. Oh my God, you do everything, don't you? <laughs> well, I don't cook. You I'm, know, I'm, so. I'm sat here with my 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 <laughs> belly hanging over my tray, feeling completely <laughs> disgusted in myself now. So thank you. <laughs> Oh. But we know that that's how the body changes. It has to be uncomfortable. It has to be challenged. It has to do things that are difficult and novel. Uh, and you have to fail in order to learn how to, to grow. <laughs> that's how the body works. And so I feel yeah. like that mindset I'm very interested in, it's, it goes way beyond intelligence. It has to do with anything that we want to cultivate or anything that we want to get good at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about okay. failing, Tim. I'm gym at five o'clock. So. <laughs> So, so there, there is that. There is that. I, I just, I, I just want to, and you know, we want to wrap up soon. Um, there, there's a couple of things I want, want, want to ask you. Two, two questions for me anyway, and I'll let Olivia take it. First of all, um, I love the way that you talked about oxytocin as being a stress hormone. I never knew that until I saw you. Yeah, I, I think of cortisol and adrenaline, etc. I, you know, and oxytocin is, you know you know often looked at as the you know is released when we hug each other and whatever so i never realized that was a stress hormone so i'd like you to um just you know just spend a, a 30 seconds or whatever just explaining that and also the other thing is are you coming to orlando to give a talk you know i'm going to be in orlando in july but not to give a talk i'm, g I'm coming to the zumba convention if you can believe you it. have to go there, Tim. You have to yeah. go to Zumba. I'll come on. I'll stalk you. Yes, I'll stalk you. I don't you even can know shake your is. booty with us. <laughs> yes. What's it, what is the Zumba convention? It's it's for Zumba teachers from all over the world, and Please, it's my first Kenny. time going. I'm like I'm totally scared and also excited. It's part of my growth mindset. Um, right. But yeah, I, Kelly, I, please I, invite him, please, please. Yeah. I would like to have a photo <laughs> yeah. with him. Please. No, no, you want a video because you know it's going to go viral on YouTube with me, yeah, uh, flapping around and floundering like a complete idiot. Yeah. So it, it's it, uh, um, 
I'm, I'm guessing that's a type of dance like rumba or samba. Or yes, it, it's all sort of world rhythms, everything from hip hop to reggaeton and salsa and samba. It's, it's If you can look like a fool doing it, Zumba will ask you to do it and then make you not care about how foolish you look while you're doing it. Like, that could be the, that's my new tagline for Zumba. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, okay, so, may, so maybe we'll be in the same uh, region, but you would have to dance. You're not going to get to hear me talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> For oxytocin, so I'll give you the, the brief download. Um, oxytocin is a hormone that helps us connect with others, but it's not as simple as the way some people talk about it. It's not like a love hormone that only makes you feel loving or loved, although sometimes oxytocin is released when we do feel loving and loved. But oxytocin is it's basically it's one of those hormones that's designed to shift your behavior in the direction of connecting with others and caring for others, particularly people you already like or trust. It, it has a, a stronger effect on sort of your tribe than it would on strangers. And oxytocin is a hormone that is often increased during stress, particularly when some part of you recognizes that your stress is bigger than yourself. So sometimes like you just need to run to catch the bus and you're going to release a lot of adrenaline and a little bit of cortisol to help you use the energy that adrenaline is giving you. Uh, and you're not going to necessarily release oxytocin because you don't need to ask for advice or you know find other people who are also running to catch the bus. You just just run and catch the bus. But there's a lot of stressful situations where you might benefit from being around people who care about you, or you might get a boost from teaming up with others who are in the same boat and facing that challenge as a, a team rather than trying to do it on your own. And in situations where the stress you're under is bigger than you. Often there is this increase in oxytocin, which makes it easier to connect with others. It motivates us to be around others. It can even make you feel lonely. And oxytocin doesn't always make you feel loved. It can make you feel lonely, which is part of how your body and brain are trying to get you to be around people who care about you so that you aren't alone in your stress. Um, and oxytocin, you know, it, it increases the, the warm glow you get from helping others. So it tends to make us behave in ways that strengthen relationships and help us receive the support we need to. Um, but again, you know, it, the, the fascinating thing about stress is there's more than one stress response. And we don't always have access to this full repertoire. Um, one of the reasons that I, I teach compassion is I believe that if we train our minds in compassion, we're more likely to train our bodies to have this kind of pro-social stress response rather than an aggressive or hostile or withdrawing stress response. Great. Okay. But Got it. Great. 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 <laughs> I, won't, I won't say, I'll stop saying to my wife, give us a kiss, give us a hug. <laughs> it releases oxytocin and she's, she's medical and she'll just say, no, it doesn't. Uh, anyway. <laughs> So, uh, Olivia, have you yeah. got any? No, I, I just, I just like to thank you, Kelly. That was an awesome, awesome talk that we have with you. Uh, yeah. One, one thing that I that I remember from the, from this discussion is you, team, you need to be compassionate with Trump. <laughs> okay, and we'll have Kelly. <laughs> Uh, having a glass of wine, and we'll have Jack Cornfield on the next yeah. one. This is what I just yeah, remember. That's your challenge. Re that's the it. recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's all <laughs> gone horribly wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I'd, I'd just like to say, yeah, I mean, r thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I, I really, really admire your work. I mean, I, I wasn't exaggerating when I said uh, the willpower instinct at the time I read it. I just it was blown away. And then you brought out the upside of stress, which was just as good. And uh, now I've started the neuroscience of change. So any, anybody listening, I'd encourage you to go through all three. Well, I don't know about neuroscience of change yet. Actually, I'm only about a quarter of the way through. But if it's anything like the other two books, then I would, I would encourage anybody uh, into getting an, under, an understanding of what makes them tick. And I think, you know, that's, you know, one of the things that we yearn after is to understand how how we um, react and how we can improve the quality of our lives. So, so, so thank you, and I'm, I'm glad I carried on digging at you on YouTube, on uh, Twitter and, and asking. So, uh, yep, perseverance right. pays off. I'm really disorganized when it comes to this kind of like promotional thing. I tend to ignore all requests, so people have to persist a little bit. I, I appreciate it. So, thank you okay. for persisting. Very, very well. Thank you. Take care. Okay. All right, Kelly. Cheers. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.